I'm gonna, this is a clinic I was actually supposed to give at the uh, MER convention uh, that was supposed to be held last month down in uh, uh, Charlotte. Um, but unfortunately it was canceled. Uh, so I volunteered it uh, for one of these uh, virtual clinics. So anyway, um, this is all about modeling an elevated railway, um, which I made in addition to my layout uh, back in January. Uh, and uh, basically thought it would uh, probably make a good clinic. So I took a lot of photos and everything while I was doing it. Uh, to start, there are three type of railways. They're surface, elevated, and underground. Uh, surface railways, uh, really that's the first choice when land costs are low. Uh, elevated railways are generally less expensive than underground railways. Um, but you use them usually in urban areas where there are not a lot of landmarks, right-of-ways are available, and basically they can build the structures such that they can go overhead. Underground railways or subways are used in urban areas where you just really can't put an elevated railway for whatever reason, or that's not practical, feasible, or whatever. Uh, but they are the most expensive. Uh, so what is an elevated railway? Well, it's uh, basically, it's a railroad, railroad that's built on structures that support the tracks off the ground. Uh, they're usually built high enough so that you can have roads uh, and often even low buildings uh, below them. Uh, they can serve a traditional railroad uh, or they can serve interurban transit railroads, uh, such as like our Metro, which actually has a combination. If you've seen in a couple places, uh, they do have uh, certain elevated areas uh, where it goes over the beltway and the like, and then it goes underground. Uh, but for this clinic, I'm going to focus on elevated subway lines. Uh, the reason is, is that, uh, as you know, I model a Long Island Railroad. Uh, and uh, when I retired from the government back in 2015, I was looking for uh, to put an, ex uh, an addition on my railroad, and I decided uh, to model um, what's called the Atlantic Branch, um, which is uh, basically Brooklyn, uh, and uh, in that area is a rather famous street called Flatbush Avenue, and I decided I wanted to model that. Um, and then along on the other side, I wanted to do the car float yards uh, that are in um, uh, Long Island City. Uh, so that was the genesis of uh, modeling uh, Brooklyn. Uh, and then I decided after uh, I had done that, uh, I ran, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but uh, I kind of fell in love with the Mike train house, Mike's train house subway system cars. Um, the reason being is that they are programmable and they have sound and they also have uh, recorded voices of conductors and station stops. Uh, and the conductors uh, on several of these sets have a very distinct Brooklyn accent. So it's really kind of neat. So I figured I got to do that. I got to have an elevated railroad uh, so I can use these cars and have these conductors uh, announcing stations in their Brooklyn accents. So an elevated railway is typically referred to as an L. Uh, you may have heard that term. And it's simply an elevated railway for transit cars that could also be used for an underground uh, sub subways. Um, the main elevated subways right now in the U.S. are in New York City and Chicago, although I believe Boston and some other cities uh, at uh, some points uh, also had elevated uh, trains. I think Boston got rid of theirs around 75 or 76. Uh, they're usually powered by an th electrified third rail. Um, the reason is it's a lot cheaper to construct and it's much more durable than if you had overhead uh, power lines like catenary. Uh, there, when you model this, uh, I kind of broke it down into four elements. Uh, one is 
um, the structure that supports the track. Uh, the second is the track itself, the third rail, and the cover boards that cover the third rail. Uh, third is, are the details that you have to add uh, to make it a realistic scene. The stations, the signals, the walkways, railings, electrical equipment. Uh, and then last but not least is the subway train itself. So let's talk first about the uh, structures that support the track. Um, these are typically made from reinforced concrete or from a variety of structural steel components, you know, I-beams, H-beams, open and closed girders. Uh, and they can be riveted, bolted, and or welded in place, depending upon basically uh, which company did the design and how they like to build things. So what follows now are some photos of some typical over, uh, older overhead railroad support structures. These are in New York City. Um, this, I think, is up in the Harlem area. Um, you can see it's, it's kind of elaborate with those arches, uh, the steel arches. And, uh, you know, if somebody was ambitious enough to try to model those, uh, it'd make a really neat model. Um, uh, they might be a little difficult. Uh, I don't know whether you could uh, heat up and bend uh, a structural piece of plastic enough to get that shape or whether you'd have to scratch build it, uh, cutting it from an arch from a big sheet or not. But um, as you can see, uh, uh, building something like that could be elaborate, uh, but would look neat. Uh, here's another one in New York City. Uh, here the arches are underneath. Uh, it's a fairly tall overhead uh, uh, elevated uh, subway. Uh, and then you can see the uprights are uh, box girders, uh, open, open box girders, uh, similar to the uh, Central Valley, uh, which you'll see that's what I used uh, on some of mine. Um, here's a more simple one. It's basically like an H-beam uh, that are on concrete pedestals, or on the left, you can see uh, uh, the pedestals are either much higher. Uh, uh, I'm not really sure why. Uh, those two, perhaps uh, there was a road going through there and they just don't want, uh, if a car were to hit it or a truck, uh, they want something a little sturdier. Uh, you can take a look at the underside. You can see that uh, basically that's a double track uh, elevated railroad. Uh, each one has two I-beams. Uh, running lengthwise, and then they have spacers, uh, beam, uh, look like I-beam spacers going across uh, for structural support. Here's actually a double-decker uh, elevated subway. There's actually two levels there. You can see the train on the upper level, uh, but there's also track on that lower level uh, behind those cross beams. Uh, and I think the concrete structure on the right there uh, is actually uh, probably a station uh, for these uh, for these elevated uh, su subways. So when you're trying to design this, uh, some things to note. One is that the track support structures, they're likely designed and built over existing roadways. In other words, the roads were probably there uh, and then the railroad was added, uh, the overhead railroad. So uh, the design, uh, the designers, when they put this up, had to customize them as necessary to uh, make sure they fit uh, within the available space and any other obstacles that were there. Uh, most of the structures typically use a wide web I-beam uh, with web reinforcements along their length for track support. Um, and then the upright supports are primarily H-beams, or they can be, as you saw, square girders, open or closed. Uh, the paint, uh, from what I've seen on the photographs, typically seems to be shades of gray or, or green. Uh, but some, I think, you know, you might be a pick a, a blue or something. Uh, uh, I don't think there's any real convention, uh, except for who was probably in charge of picking the paint at the time. 
almost all of them you see, unless it was just recently painted, they all have signs of weathering. Uh, rust, some peeling paint uh, are common on most of the steel components. Now modeling the support structure itself. The structure can be either scratch built or built from a kit. Uh, Microengineering makes several city viaducts, elevated track sections. City viaduct is what the name of the kit is. Uh, if you look on uh, either their website or even in hobby stores or on eBay or whatever, uh, you'll see the price range, the prices for these uh, uh, city viaducts uh, range from about $25 for a 90 foot single track section to about $55 for a 150 foot double track section. These are scale feet. So uh, keep in mind the typical uh, HO box car is about 40 feet. Uh, so you're talking $25 for a section, a 90 foot section, which is basically just as long as two box cars uh, or a single track set, I mean, or a double track section, for example, uh, that's 150 feet. Uh, which would be uh, something on the order of uh, four box cars long. Uh, Excuse me, can I ask a question? Sure. Do they have these also for N scale, or in your opinion, or knowledge only HO? I, you know, I don't really know because I've never really looked uh, to see if they're available for N scale. They might be, um, but I, I just don't know. Uh, because I model an HO, so I never really checked to see if they were available in other scales. Okay, thank you. Um, this is what they look like. This is the the 90 foot double track city viaduct section. Um, uh, and um, as I said, you know, they make a 150 foot one, they make a 90 foot double track, they make, I think, a 90 foot single track, and they probably make a 150 foot single track. Uh, most elevated subways, uh, you know, just like our metro, is, are typically double track because they have trains going in each direction. So here's a picture of uh, the uh, several microengineering double track viaducts joined together. Um, this is a picture from the company. Um, uh, and you can see. Uh, that it looks pretty good actually um, when they're painted up and everything. Uh, and I found these uh, also on the internet. This is a layout, I think it's out in St. Louis, uh, a guy named Vic Smith. Uh, very neat looking layout from all the photographs. It's called City Edge Layout. Uh, and he does basically a, a, a city scene. And uh, these look like he took the, uh, uh, the microscale engineering city viaducts, but he had to modify them. Uh, because if you note on this one, uh, the web, um, that cross webbing uh, supports there, um, they are flush uh, with, the, uh, with the track support beams, those, those wide web beams there. Whereas here you can see uh, they pooch out a little bit more. Uh, so I, it looks like he had to modify them uh, in order to widen them. Uh, and just here's another shot that I found of his uh, subway. Uh, it looks like a terminal here or terminus. Um, but the benefit of the, uh, the microengineering is they're relatively quick to assemble. I mean, it's a plastic kit. Uh, you glue them up and uh, paint them. Uh, they have good detail, all that webbing and everything is very realistic. So they are realistic looking. Um, but the downside, you know, which is why, you know, because I considered using them. Uh, but there are a bunch of reasons why not. One is the, uh, the upright width and the elevation on these things are fixed. Uh, so it may not work if you're adding the L over an existing road, uh, which is what I was doing. You know. uh, or then they're going to have to get in there and start hacking them up and modify them. Because uh, if they don't uh, match the width of the road you're putting it over, then you're liable to have uh, 
I-beams uh, or box beams, whatever, uh, that have to be set in the middle of the road, which is not very prototypic. They don't make curve sections either that I'm aware of. Uh, so if you, and, you know, unless you're just doing a straight uh, point to point, uh, you would probably have to start again going in and butchering these things, uh, modifying them in order to uh, make curves. Uh, there's no variety in design with them. Uh, they're all the same design. And as you saw some of the pictures there, um, uh, that a lot of overhead railroads, uh, the supports vary. In other words, they'll use one design in a certain area and then it will switch all of a sudden. So if you wanted to have uh, a variety of designs on your overhead, uh, then you would have to start scratch building because this doesn't have any variety, they're all the same. Um, overall cost can be expensive depending upon the length of your overhead railroad. Um, You'll see later, mine was going to be something on the order of about 20 feet. Uh, so you can do the math, but if I were to buy the double, uh, the 150 foot section, double track sections, uh, probably would have cost me something on the order of five, $600 uh, just to, to have, just to buy the uh, microengineering supports to, to go that length. And remember, that doesn't include the track or the rail or anything. This is just the support structure. So I went the scratch building route. Uh, so the first thing I had to do is pick a design for my track support structure. And you know, as you saw from the pictures, the structures vary significantly and can be mixed designs. Uh, and there's no magic. I mean, it's really a matter of what you want to build, what you like. Uh, I went to the internet, okay, there's a wealth of pictures uh, that you can find of, you know, photos that show a variety of track support structures. You know, I showed a couple before, uh, there's lots of others. Uh, uh, so you just kind of pick what you want. Um, I would just say make sure that the structural plastic components uh, that you would need to model these uh, supports are available. Uh, for example, with those big arched curves before, uh, you know, they look great, but uh, make sure you can model them. Uh, make sure you know what you're getting into. Uh, Plastruct and Evergreen are good sources, good sources for, for plastic and structural shapes. Um, I think they're uh, probably about the, the, the main ones, uh, and they do have a wide variety, so uh, uh, you're not really that limited. So I decided to scratch build mine, uh, and just so, you know, um, I'll fess up, and that is that I previously built an overhead subway for my city terminal zone section of my layout about 15 years ago. Uh, so. Uh, I did this once before. <laughs> um, here's a picture of my overhead subway line in what's called my city terminal zone, which is supposed to be New York City. Um, the, that section of my layout. Um, and you can see the overhead structure that I used. Uh, that was a matter, that was basically, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, wide, you know, wide web I beams. Um, uh, then I added uh, stiffeners in there, and then the support structure in this case was a lot of the uh, uh, Central Valley uh, beams and girders, the, the box beams, the open channel box beams. And so here was a picture I had taken way back uh, when it was under construction. Um, so you can see uh, I've used two I-beams uh, for each track. Uh, uh, and then I had to build a support structure around uh, the, the lower track on there. And this is what it looks like today. Um, this is, these, those are the uh, Mike Trainhouse subway cars. Uh, those are two scratch-built stations, elevated stations. 
uh, on my New York City uh, terminal zone uh, area. So anyway, my proposed elevated subway, uh, I, need, I wanted to retrofit it to run above Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn on my, this Atlantic branch of my Long Island Railroad. So the track would have to be a double track point to point line uh, with a station stop at each end. Uh, and one of my objectives was I wanted to really minimize the view block that of the retail stores that I had on Flatbush Avenue that were gonna be caused by putting a track support structure right down the middle of the road. Um, so I didn't want a lot of that, that webbing on the side that, for example, that you saw uh, on uh, the, the microengineering. I wanted something that would give, hopefully, the viewers uh, uh, the least obstruction. And so he here's a view of Flatbush Avenue uh, my, in the Brooklyn area on my layout, but this is before I installed the overhead uh, subway. Um, most of those signs, I, I did an article, I think, in, I think it was either the local or the, uh, the flyer on making those. Basically, they're from the internet. Uh, if you go on the internet and uh, just Google storefronts, New York City storefronts or Brooklyn storefronts, you get a wealth of pictures. And so I, I found pictures of, of signs in front of buildings. Uh, that were head on and they didn't have any obstructions in front and I just printed them out, uh, resized them, uh, printed them out on gloss uh, photograph paper, cut them out and mounted them, glued them onto a piece of uh, thin styrene plastic and then they could be glued to the front of the stores. So here's another view of Flatbush Avenue, uh, again, before I installed the overhead uh, subway. Uh, and you can see all those signs I had there. And that was really what I was trying to do was prevent all those signs from being uh, blocked uh, too much by the, when I added the overhead subway. So here's sort of a panoramic view of the Flat, of Flatbush Avenue uh, before I installed the overhead. That's uh, what I call Holbin Yard uh, on the right there. Uh, the freight yard and then uh, Flatbush Avenues in the back. Whoop, let me go back a minute. Um, okay, so here's again Flatbush Avenue, just looking at it from the other side, the other direction. Um, and then um, Flatbush Avenue comes up right around where those tracks go through the tunnel. Uh, and you see a roadway crossing there. Um, uh, that now becomes what I call Nostrand Avenue, uh, which is again another uh, road in, in Brooklyn. Uh, and that goes on down to that uh, lower right corner. So if you look at the white arrow uh, going along, that's the planned route of my elevated subway, uh, was to just go right above Flatbush Avenue and then also above Nostrand Avenue down at this end. So I did have to have a little bend in it uh, at that one point. So building the supports, I uh, use Central Valley uh, steel bridge girders uh, for the uprights. Um, and uh, Plastruck uh, I-beams were used for cross member uh, and track supports. I used the Plastruck 1 8 inch T's for the I-beam web braces. Uh, Plastruck uh, 330 second styrene angles or L-shaped beams were used for the I-beam cross member web braces at, at the, uh, the I-beam ends, and I'll show you that in a minute. Alexander Scale Models makes equipment bases, uh, which were used for the upright support bases. And then I took small brads, uh, you know, just small nails with the pointed end cut off. And I glued these in uh, the bottom of the equipment bases, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and these were locating pins, so I could uh, locate the, the uprights. So here's a picture uh, of a typical upright. Uh, you can see uh, across the, the the I-beam across the top, uh, 
I've added uh, the web uh, the web supports. That's the T-shaped uh, piece of plastic that's seven eighths uh, apart. There's nothing magic about that. I just thought it looked fairly prototypic, but that's not a magic number uh, by any means. Um, and then the L-shaped pieces, they, they would mount up in the corners. Uh, again, they're all for stiffeners and uh, structural support. Uh, and then at the bottom, you can see I've got the Alexander scale models uh, equipment bases glued to the bottom of the uh, uh, Central Valley uh, beams. And just here's another picture with, uh, you can see I've got a cutoff brad um, that's glued into the recess. The, the Alexander Models equipment base has a little recess underneath it, which was very convenient. Because uh, what I could do is I could just put some glue in there and then I would put the, the head of the brad, the, the flat head of the brad in there and glue it in place. Uh, and that became a locating uh, uh, pin uh, for this. And here you can see I got several uprights in place. Um, and what I, the only thing I had to do to locate them, you see the ones that are freestanding, is just drill a small hole in the sidewalk. Uh, and then I could set them right in place and they would stay there uh, while I then constructed uh, the track right on top of it, or the, or the, the I-beams, the track support beams and everything on, on top of it. Um, Again, uh, I painted these a medium gray and then I weathered them with rust colored weathering powders. Uh, this is the Bragdon Industries uh, weathering powders. I know you can get them up at Mainline Hobbies or whatever. Um, they're really neat because they, uh, they actually set up, you don't have to overspray them or anything. Once you put them on, uh, they, they stick and they don't come off, they don't come off in your hands. Building the horizontal track supports. Um, these were Plastruck 5 8 I beams, 15. They come 15 inches long. And I used two beams to support each track. Uh, T shaped web supports were cut to length, as I mentioned, and glued in place every 7 8 of an inch. Uh, and I said, note, because of the number of web supports needed, okay, remember I was doing a section that was almost 20 feet long. Uh, so when I'm doing web supports every seven eighths of an inch, so you can do the math, you know how many I need. So basically, uh, Northwest Short Line or a chopper, or if there's uh, other companies that make something that's similar, uh, it, to me it's almost mandatory to make sure you get these things and you cut them all to the same length. And so this is what a Northwest Short Line chopper looks like. Uh, it's basically a, uh, a pivot uh, with a razor blade on it, and then you have a stop, uh, that black thing right underneath, that's adjustable. Uh, so you set it, uh, you, un you unclamp it, those two black knobs at the, up at the top there. You unclamp it, you can slide that black piece uh, to the right uh, uh, location. Uh, so then when you put a slip a piece of plastic in there, uh, and it butts up against that, that black piece there uh, at the right length. Then you just bring the handle down and it chops it at the, uh, at the right length. So my I-beams were spaced apart such that the ties from the flex track uh, would rest across about half of the flange width. Uh, so you, what you really need to do is measure your uh, whatever track you're using. I used Atlas uh, Code 83 flex track. Uh, uh, so once, once I took a measurement of a tie uh, and I said, okay, uh, I want uh, the end of this tie to rest right about at the middle of the, of the top of the flange. Uh, so that set the width of the two uh, I-beams. Uh, so I cut the H-beams, uh, oh, I cut some H-beams, some plastruct H-beams that I mentioned. Uh, they were cut the length and glued between the beams every four inches, uh, and this was to keep the I-beams properly spaced. And here's a picture of the, uh, uh, the H-beams glued in place. Uh, 
Uh, you can see they're they're cut to length. They're they're glued. I glued them on one side uh, of the I beam, uh, and then I have the other side, as you see. Those white pieces at the end, um, uh, they're connecting tabs, and what they are is I have one I have one glued on each side, so it's sort of like a you know that the other beam uh, would slip inside of it uh, on the other end, and it allows the you to uh, butt these beams up uh, without uh, and keep them in, in place while you're building the whole thing. Um, so as I said, it's easiest to first to locate the upright supports, uh, and then once one horizontal beam uh, was then put in place. So I didn't glue these. By, by the way, I didn't glue these together yet. Okay, I've got these two pieces now. Okay. Uh, so I go back over onto the layout. Um, I've got the uprights in place. So I put one horizontal beam in, in place and I connect it to the end of the preceding beam. Now, obviously, you've got to start with one beam at one end and then I work my way down. Um, so what, let's assume you, you've got your first beams in, in, in place. Um, then I could put that one horizontal beam and I could slip those, uh, I could slip it in place and connect it up with the other beam that was already there uh, and set it down on top of the upright, but I didn't glue it or anything. Then I put the second horizontal beam in place, uh, again, connecting it to the preceding beam, uh, but not gluing it to the preceding beam, just sl sliding it in place. And so now once both beams are properly positioned, then I could go in there with my, with my liquid glue and uh, put it on the ends of the H beams, the spacers, um, together. And then I could uh, basically clamp them together and let the glue dry. Uh, so now I had a, uh, a pair of uh, I beams with the webs as a track support that were 15 inches long. Um, once that was all dry, I did it one more time with another pair of 15 inch horizontal support beams uh, uh, connected to the first one. So now I have a horizontal track support section that's about 30 inches long. Um, here's a picture of when I was constructing uh, the track supports. Um, you can see um, now in this case I had a I had a bend in the so that was a little tricky I had to cut notches in the beams uh, to get them to bend a little bit to the right direction. Um, uh, but what I did is um, you know once they were in place and glued together um, that whole section could now be lifted out. Okay, um, on, on each track. Okay, and. Here's a picture of the H-beam spacers, spacers uh, glued every four inches. Uh, so you can see this is what a finished horizontal track support section would look like. Again, uh, I was building them in uh, two pieces of 30 inches. So I had two 15 inch I-beams joined together. So each one was 30 inches long. And then I could, uh, you know, once I had this 30 inch horizontal track support section constructed, um, the next, sec next step was to paint it and weather it. Um, now, once it was painted and weathered, uh, I could set it back in place on the layout. And now is when I added the track. I used Atlas Code 83 Flex Track, I think I mentioned that. Um, I attached the track to the horizontal track support beams, uh, I beams with contact cement. Um, you know, it's not uh, homosote or anything, so you're not going to spike it in place. You really have to glue it. Uh, and uh, uh, contact cement seems to work the best in terms of being something that will permanently hold everything in place. Um, the top part of the I-beam flange uh, and the underside of the track were coated with contact cement. Uh, and if you ever use contact cement, uh, what you have to do is you brush it on uh, and then you let it sit for about 15 or 20 minutes until it gets, basically it dries, but it becomes tacky. 
Um, now you got to be careful with contact cement if you've if you've not used it because once you put something together, it's pretty well stuck. Um, it's not going to come apart. You don't have a lot of time to move it around like you do with other glues uh, before it sets up. Um, so the horizontal track support section was that was I put it I would put it in place. Remember, it's got the contact cement on it. So I'd set it in place on top of the upright supports. Um, holding the track, which also had contact cement on the bottom, if you remember, uh, at a shallow angle, uh, so it wasn't touching uh, the top of the I-beams. Um, I put the track, uh, the end with the connectors, uh, and connected it up with the adjoining track. Uh, once I had, once I pushed it up so the rails were joined, uh, and they were tight, there were no gaps or anything. Uh, I then carefully set the track down on top of the horizontal support beams. Uh, again, once, once you put it down, uh, it's pretty well stuck there uh, because of the contact cement. So make sure your track is centered uh, so that your, the end of your ties are sitting right in the middle of that uh, web. Um, there is, quite honestly, with contact cement, once you put it down, once you put something down, uh, you can push it slightly. Uh, it'll move slightly. Uh, uh, so you can, if, you're, if, you don't get it, if you don't get the track exactly in the middle, you can push it real quick uh, and get it centered after it's been set down there. Uh, but once that contact cement sets up, it's not going to move. So once the track is glued to the horizontal support structure, uh, you can remove the whole horizontal support structure and the track, take it back to the workbench so you now you can start working on putting on the third rail and the cover boards. So let's talk about adding a third rail. Now a, third, a prototypic third rail is mounted on insulators, uh, usually a set distance from the rails. Uh, a prototypic subway running an electrified third rail is not going to have sharp curves on it usually. Uh, so truck interference with the third rail is usually not an issue. Um, electric trains typically have pickups on both sides of the trucks, so the third rail can be located on either side of the track. And quite honestly, if you ever rode the Metro, you'll see that the third rail can uh, alternate be on each side of the track because uh, there's pickups on, on both sides. Uh, I use code 55 rail uh, to model the third rail, and I just glued it to the edge of the ties with contact cement. Um, normally a third rail is set up on insulators, um, but uh, I didn't model those because one is that uh, uh, it's a real, I'll be quite honest, it's a pain in the butt trying to get that thing uh, gluing on insulators and then trying to glue uh, a rail on top of it. Um, and then the other reason is basically once you've got the cover boards on, uh, it's almost impossible to see. Uh, uh, so I, I just quite honestly didn't feel it was necessary to model the insulators. Now, you know, if, you know, if, you have a third rail and maybe it's going to be much closer to the front of the layout where people can look at it real close, then you may want to put those insulators on. Uh, but here's just a photograph of the third rail uh, glued to the edge of the flex track ties. Again, I just used the contact cement. Uh, I brushed it on the bottom of the Code 55 rail and I just dabbed it along the edge of the ties uh, there. And then once again, after about 15, 20 minutes, I could uh, lay the 55 rail directly onto the edge of the ties. Modeling the cover boards. Uh, cover boards are wooden boards, or they can be other material. Uh, in the old days, they used to be wood. Uh, now I've seen a lot that are metal. Uh, some are composite. Um, but basically, uh, they sit above, but they don't touch the third rail, and their purpose is essentially to protect the third rail from the elements like snow and stuff, and also to protect people from inadvertently touching the third rail. Uh, so, uh, but not all third rail electrified trains use a cover board, so it's not mandatory that you have cover boards. Uh, 
Uh, here's a tip. Here's a picture of a typical uh, cover board uh, mounted over a, a third rail. Uh, you can see there's the cover board, there's a cover board support, and then there's the third rail underneath it. And then here's a third rail that does not have a cover board. Um, uh, again, uh, now you can see it's got a sliding pickup shoe uh, that rides along the third rail, and that's where it gets its electricity from. And then here, this is in New York City. Um, Here's pictures of a third rail cover board. Uh, and as you can see, uh, one cover board, uh, you know, on the approach, if you're, you're coming from the bottom of the screen, um, the third rail is on the right. And then uh, there's a little overlap period or section, I should say. Uh, and then the third rail picks up again on the left side of the rail. Um, but you can see, uh, there's cover boards and then the, uh, those marks on top are the supports uh, for the cover board. Now the material for the cover boards, uh, you can make it out of strip basswood, strip styrene, plastic, or even possibly brass strips. I've not tried that, but I'm sure they would probably work. Um, each has its own pros and cons. Uh, cover board supports can be easily made uh, from industrial grade staples. Uh, that's how I made mine. Uh, I just got a bunch of Arrow uh, T50 staples from the hardware store. Uh, you can separate them. Uh, so you get a single staple down there on the lower left. Uh, and then I just get a pair of diagonal cutters and I nip off the uh, one, one of the L's areas down at the bottom. Uh, and also the, the chisel end uh, on the top. So I basically get an L-shaped piece, as you see uh, on the lower right. Uh, wood cover boards are prototypic on some third rail electric railroads. I remember back up when I was growing up on Long Island, uh, most of the third rail cover boards were just pieces of wood. Uh, but as I said, you know, nowadays I've, I've seen metal uh, and I've seen composite boards. Uh, basically, the railroad's looking for whatever's going to last the longest, requires the least maintenance, uh, and it's probably also the cheapest. Um, when I did my New York City uh, city terminal zone, I, uh, I used wood strips, uh, and I was gluing them to those metal staples. And... Uh, that can be a little bit of a challenge because uh, using, you know, unless you find the right kind of glue, uh, what I was finding was a lot of times the, uh, uh, those metal staples would not really adhere very well to the pieces of wood. Um, it worked eventually, but I know on a lot of times I had to go back and re-glue re them. Um, Strip styrene plastic can also look prototypic of uh, wood, metal, or a composite cover board. Um, and what I found was that if you use liquid plastic cement, uh, you can dab a little bit onto the uh, plastic strip uh, that's simulating a cover board. Uh, it'll soften it enough that you can actually set the metal staple uh, support in place and it'll stick there. Uh, and then you can come back and just put a, a thin layer of uh, a more permanent type of glue, an all-purpose glue. I, I was using some Duco cement. Uh, uh, and that makes for a pretty permanent bond. I didn't have too much trouble with the uh, staples pulling off of that at all. Uh, but cover boards made from thin plastic strips can warp and interfere with the trucks. So you got to make sure that when you install them, they do lie flat. Um, now, thin brass strips are rigid, uh, and I think the metal supports could probably just be soldered in place on top, uh, which would really make a, a good, strong uh, bond. However, I think brass is going to be a lot more expensive than basswood or plastic strips. And as I said, my previous experience with gluing the metal supports to strip basswood was not that great, so I decided to use strip styrene plastic for my cover boards. Um, 
Now, glue and also when you paint the cover boards, because you got to paint these things uh, some kind of a gray usually, um, the paint and stuff when it dries uh, can cause very thin styrene strips to warp. Okay. Um, but that's not a problem um, if your supports are not spaced too far apart because they will pull it right back into shape. So here's a typical styrene strip with support posts glued in place and painted. You can see I got a little bit of a warpage in there um, on this. This is one end of one. I was usually making them uh, for a little bit longer than this. Um, uh, but once you start mounting it and everything uh, and you glue it in place, uh, you can glue them such that they, they, lay, they lay flat. So all I did is I drilled a hole in the I-beam web and located the first support. Uh, then I could uh, go just move along and I could mark where the second support would go and drill a hole for that. Um, and then I would just continue along until the cover board was installed on top of the third rail. Um, uh, once, everything, once all the holes were drilled, uh, and uh, the cover board uh, looked like it was in, you know, in the right position and everything. Then I just added a little bit of glue uh, to the supports and the holes uh, until it dried. And then I had a, uh, a nice cover board right on top. Um, so after the third rail and cover boards were installed, the completed section of track and the track support structure can now be permanently installed. Uh, so once I once the support structure was installed, uh, I'm sorry. Once the completed track and the support structure were installed, then I glued switch ties, uh, cut the length between the dual rail sections at every fourth tie. I'll show you a picture of this. And this was done because it would provide supports for the walkways and also the electrical equipment. Uh, now here's a picture of the cover boards in place over the third rail. This is at uh, the Nostrand Avenue end of my uh, uh, elevated subway. Uh, with the, that's the Nostrand Avenue station there. Um, but you can see the cover boards. Um, you really don't even see that third rail because of the cover boards and, their, and the angle that, that you're looking at. Um, here's a picture of when I was still constructing along. Uh, I hadn't put the cover boards yet on the back section of track. Um, but you can see I've got the, uh, I'm sorry, I take that back. That cover board is on the back section. It's just I switched over on the back side there. Um, you can see the, uh, uh, the switch ties that I cut the length and then I glued between uh, the two track sections. Uh, and what that did is that allowed uh, uh, for support of the uh, walkways. And I'll get into that in a second. So here's just a picture of construction moving along. Uh, I said, note the cover, the third rail cover boards are in place in the foreground track there. Uh, I still needed to add it to the one, uh, the track on the uh, right there. Um, no, I take that back. I'm sorry. That, that also has the cover board on it. Uh, it was the track section up on the left side there, uh, on the track on the left. Uh, you can see that's a 30 inch section that I had not, it's not glued in place yet. It's just set in place. Um, and then the next step would have been to take that out, uh, uh, mount the third rail on it, put the cover boards, and then I would put the whole thing back in place and, and glue it down. Um, just here's another picture of progress moving along uh, from one end of the layout to the other. Again, here is the, uh, you can see the uprights uh, in place and the, uh, the uh, the horizontal uh, support, track support uh, being added uh, along the whole length there. So here I'm getting almost to the other end. Uh, took a while, but I was getting there. Uh, so now the next step uh, was building the station and the station platforms. On a double track line, you can have station platforms either be on the outside of each track or in the center between the two tracks. 
Now the available space on my layout dictated that there should be a single station platform between the two tracks. If you remember the photograph I had of my uh, city terminal zone on that one, I actually had uh, stations on each side of the track of the two tracks uh, with no station, with no platform in the, in the middle. Uh, but due to space limitations, I decided I was just going to have a single platform in, in the center. So the one thing you got to remember is your platform height should be even with the subway car doors. And plus the station platform needs to be long enough such that the passengers can exit from all of the doors on all of the cars of the train. So when that train pulls in, uh, if you remember on like most subway cars, all the doors open. So you don't want somebody stepping out and not finding a platform there. So make sure your platform is long enough uh, to uh, so that all when when all the passengers when all cars that are on your train pull into the station there there's a platform there. I use Walter's Cornerstone Suburban Station Platform Kit for my stations. Uh, the reason was it comes with four platforms, uh, and you could butt these together. And the platform length was almost exactly the length of a four car subway train. And the platform is one and five eighths inches wide. Uh, so double track spacing at stations should be such that the subway cars just clear the platform edge when in the station. So um, you got to be careful. So you got to think ahead really when you're putting in a station to make sure that your subway tracks. Uh, are uh, you understand you know that they're the right distance apart so when you put that platform in there uh, uh, the trains are just gonna gonna come up to the edge of it uh, so how did I do that well I put short 5 8 inch I-beams uh, on top of the track support structure cross beam um, I glued these on the, then I glued I beams, 5 8 I beams on top of the cross beams, the length of the station platform, but they were set in a little bit. And I'll show you a picture in a second. So when a station platform is placed on top of the I beams, it turns out the platform height uh, just matches the subway doors. So those 5 8 I beams, uh, that seems to be a magic number. Uh, so you can see. Um, on the upper left there, it shows it's, it's a 5 8 I-beam cut and glued on top of the support structure. Um, those were the cross, those cross beams that we're going to cross. Um, and then once I had those glued in place, then I could put longitudinal beams, the 5 8 I-beams. Uh, you can see they're set in a little bit uh, 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 on top of those uh, those short uh, I beams, uh, and that would be the station support. So here you can see uh, the station uh, platform is set right on top of those two I beams, uh, and uh, it's the right height for the subway cars, uh, and also the the track spacing is perfect. So when the subway cars pull in, the cars are you know, essentially very close to that platform. Now on each end of the station, I needed an entrance structure. Uh, and so I scratch built one at each end. Uh, this is where passengers would have to access from the street uh, to come up to the platform and enter onto the platform. Um, passenger access to the platform entrance uh, is typically in New York was by a stairway from the street, uh, at an elevated subway terminal uh, that ends against the layout room wall, uh, the stairway would need to be visible. On the other end of my layout, uh, you'll see in a minute, uh, the, uh, the, the station ended uh, right at the edge of the layout uh, with an aisle there. So one could uh, easily argue that there was a, uh, a stairway coming up, it just I didn't have any place to model it. Uh, but you can imagine it there. So what did I do? I went back to my favorite. I searched the internet for an appropriate photo of an elevated subway access stairway, and fortunately I found one. I resized it to the proper scale as necessary, and then I cut the fit and glued it in place. So here's a picture of the photo I found. 
of a uh, elevated subway stairway uh, in New York City. Uh, here I printed it out and I cropped it to fit uh, on my backdrop. Uh, and here it is in place. So hopefully when you look at my layout, you see that stairway and it uh, should look like a stairway leading up to that entrance structure uh, for the platform. Now there's walkways and railings uh, on both underground and overhead subways. Uh, they need to provide walkways next to the track, uh, not only for worker access, uh, and pass, but also passenger egress in the event of an emergency. Uh, if the train breaks down or something, you got to get people off that train. They got to be able to get off it and walk somewhere. So these are typically made of wooden planks on the, for the older type, for example, or the newer ones now have steel grids. And then they always have railings up there uh, to provide for, for safety. Uh, here's a picture. You can see the walkways. These are steel grid walkways. Uh, and you can see the railings uh, on both sides. Uh, so if there was ever an emergency and people had to get off the train, uh, they had a walkway that they could walk along. Uh, railings to make sure they didn't fall down between, you know, onto the street uh, and, uh, and get to a, an, an exit. Uh, the walkways were modeled using evergreen uh, groove siding. Uh, uh, and uh, what I did is I cut the siding uh, into strips that were basically simulated four, four planks, uh, four groove widths. Uh, and then I staggered horizontal lines. Uh, I cut those in with an X-Acto knife uh, into the strips just to simulate the plank end, so it looks like they were planks of a finite length. Um, walkways were painted a dark brown. Again, and I added some weathering over it. Um, but they were glued in place and then weathered. And here's a picture. You can see this shows a lot better the those uh, uh, switch ties that I put uh, glued between uh, uh, the, the two track sections and then I used that to support um, the walkway planking uh, and then the uh, railings. Railings I just made from styrene rod, uh, the upright posts are evergreen number 221, three quarter, three and three sixty fourths diameter rods. Railings are uh, the, 0.025 diameter rods. Uh, the base is an evergreen or plastruct uh, 0.1 or a tenth of an inch square strips. Um, these were nice because you could build a railing separately and then just glue them in place rather than try to put little uh, rods uh, individually uh, onto the top of the track there. Uh, again, that Northwest Shoreline chopper came in real handy to cut the uprights to desired length because I was making railings that had to go the entire length of the room. Um, I would drill holes uh, in a tenth of an inch square strip every seven eighths of an inch. I'd insert an upright and just use some liquid glue and glue it in place. Uh, once that was dry, I could just glue the railings to the uprights. Uh, here's a picture of a typical railing that uh, one tenth of an inch square uh, strip is at the bottom uh, with holes drilled in it. And then I just put, I glued the rods uh, to the uprights. And then here's a picture of the railings installed along the right of way. Now signals. Subways use different signal lights from surface railroads. Um, uh, they're typically lower and closer to the track than surface railways, and they have a long, narrow oval shape. And I'm guessing most of this is because of the limited space uh, that they have. Uh, unlike uh, surface railroads, where you probably have a wide right of way on each side and they can use the big signals, um, these have very limited space. So the signals have to be compact, narrow, uh, and can't be sticking up uh, real high or anything. 
um, doing some research on it. Uh, there's some, I've seen minor variations in design. Uh, uh, some systems even use dwarf signals rather than up on a pole. Um, if you're interested in it, there's a good description I found of the New York City subway signaling system uh, on Wikipedia. Uh, and that's the link. Uh, here's a picture of a typical subway signal. Uh, you can see it looks a little different than a typical surface railroad one. Um, so how do you model these? Well, I was not avail I was not aware of any available HO scale signals that were prototypic of elevated subway signals. Um, so I went back to my old standby, which is I started searching eBay uh, under HO scale. And I found several vendors that sell signals that look similar to elevated subway signals. Um, they're not exact, but they're close. Um, I needed to modify these a bit to uh, make them look more prototypic. Um, that entailed removing the upper and lower platforms uh, and the ladder. So here's an inexpensive signal I found on eBay. These are some of the ones I think that come from China. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff like that, and they're they actually they work fine. Uh, they have LEDs in them. You can see the resistor in there, um, but they'll run on 12 volts uh, with that, uh, so they're, that's handy. Uh, uh, but this is what they look like when you buy them. And uh, what I did is, like I said, I removed the upper and lower platform. Uh, they were soldered on, so you could just get a soldering gun and touch them, and uh, that stuff will come right off. Uh, so now I've got a signal with a pole on it, and I was able to mount those uh, to the uh, uprights uh, that support, and then I can run the wires directly down under the layout. Um, now, in this, I don't have a, this is not an operating signaling system. Uh, I mean, it's only a point to point. Uh, so it's not like uh, they have to, and I've only got one, one set of subway cars for each track. Uh, so I just, I just made them green since I figured, you know, uh, when my subways are running, you know, it's going to be a clear shot to the next station. Uh, obviously if you have a more complex system or whatever, you could put in a, uh, an operating signaling system, uh, probably similar to you do on a, you know, a regular surface railroad. Last thing, subway trains. Uh, where do you get subway trains? Uh, in HO scale, there are several options. Lifelike, which is now Walther's, uh, had made a Proto 1000 four-car subway train set. It was DC, didn't have sound, uh, uh, and they were nice. So I, I actually owned a couple sets of them. Uh, they ran nice and smooth uh, and everything, and I imagine I never tried to take them apart to put a decoder in, but I'm sure you could. Uh, these have been discontinued. Uh, but I've, I see them available on, on eBay, uh, so they are, you can still get them. Uh, Fanaro and Camerlengo makes an unpowered uh, New York City R19 subway car kit. I guess it's a resin kit um, for about $50. Uh, however, then you would have to come up with a way to power it uh, uh, to make it so it would run. Um, there are some brass subway car sets uh, that were imported by Model Traction Supply uh, some time ago. Um, these, I've seen these occasionally advertised on e eBay. Um, you know, they're, they're not, there's not, you know, it's not like they're totally available, but occasionally they show up. Uh, but every time I've seen them, they're not cheap. Uh, usually a set of those things runs over $1,000 because they're brass and everything in there, probably because they're probably now a little bit rare since they're not made anymore. So here's a picture of the Walters Proto 1000 Red Bird uh, four car subway train set. Um, they made some other sets that weren't the Red Birds. The Red Birds is because of the color. Um, uh, they had some that were in this, uh, I think uh, a dark burgundy, like a, um, a, a Tuscan red or so. Uh, they also came in dark green, I think. Uh, but uh, this is what they look like. Uh, they ran nice. Um, 
Uh, and I, like I said, they're still available. And if you wanted to run it, you know, if you had an overhead uh, subway system and just wanted to put a DC transformer on it, uh, you could do that uh, and run these cars. Now, Mike's train house makes a number of two car and four car New York City subway train sets, both DCC ready and with DCC and sound. Uh, and quite honestly, this is one of the reasons I wanted to put an elevated subway uh, over my Flatbush Avenue because of these trains. Uh, as I said before, uh, not only are they DCC, but they have sound um, and they have a conductor that will announce various New York City stations, uh, which you can all, you can program. Um, and different sets, different train sets have different sets of station stops. So uh, it depends on what line uh, you want to, you want to, model um, it will have different station stops and you can look up on the website um, uh, as well as i think trainland uh train sells these um, and you can find uh i think they have the brochures for them that tell you what station stops uh, they each each set av advertises um, what's really neat about them is they're programmable Okay, so they will start and stop at pre-selected locations on your layout. This is neat because what I can do is I program these so that they go to one, they, they start at one of my stations, okay, uh, which I call Flatbush Avenue, okay. They start out, you can, you, you turn your throttle up, your DCC, you, you start it up, that train will run along at whatever speed you want it to, okay. And it knows when to stop at the other station. And it will slow down and pull in and stop at that station. Um, I think it actually, somehow there's an, uh, an analog uh, in, the, in the computer in the thing um, that measures uh, rotations of the motor. Uh, so it knows how far the train has uh, traveled. So like I said, you can have it so it goes between stations at a very slow speed and it will still automatically start and stop at the right spots, or you can speed it up and it will still automatically start and stop at the right. And when it gets to the station, it stops there. Uh, you'll hear sound effects, you'll hear doors opening, uh, you'll hear people making noise. Uh, you'll hear a conductor uh, announce that we've, uh, you know, you've come into the station, stand clear of the doors, et cetera. Uh, it'll say, you know, uh, the next stop is and announce the station. Uh, and then the train will automatically start up and go to the end of, the, go to the next station. And it'll do the same thing down there and then it'll turn around and go the other way. So uh, you can let these things basically go on automatic. Uh, and so anyway, that's the good news. The bad news is Mike's Train House recently announced they're closing. So I don't know how long these trains are going to still be available. I imagine um, uh, Train World still has them and stuff, um, but I don't know how long. I, once they're sold out, I don't know if anyone's going to pick up uh, the dies or anything and manufacture these in, anymore. So here's a picture of the Mike Train House, uh, Mike's Train House four car subway train set. Uh, this is sitting in um, the station down at the Nostrand Avenue end of my layout. Uh, so anyway, to finish up, overhead railways uh, are not difficult to build. They take a little bit of time and stuff, uh, but they're not hard. It's not, it's not you know, uh, something that requires these, some great skill or anything, okay? Uh, and they're going to add a lot more railroading action to an urban scene. Uh, so, for example, when I have an operating session, uh, I can set the subway to run back and forth uh, while everyone else is operating on down on the, uh, the regular railroad and everything. Um, uh, but again, it, it's adding to the, uh, the atmosphere uh, that you're in New York City, that you've got uh, a lot of trains moving around, you've got overhead subways going back and forth. Um, when you scratch build, then you're, as a modeler, you have many options to choose from regarding the design of the track support structure, your station platforms. Uh, sky's the limit 
Uh, you can have concrete uh, station, uh, as you saw in some of those pictures. Um, uh, you can have uh, rather elaborate uh, track support structures if you really feel moved to, to want to build that. Um, so the purpose of this clinic was really just to give you an example of one construction method, what, what, what I did, okay? Um, but obviously there's no, uh, this isn't the only way to do it. There's many, many ways and the like, and it was just really to kind of give you an idea of what, what can be done. So here's a finished view. Uh, this is the station at Flatbush Avenue, uh, the other end. You can see there's a four car train coming into that station. Uh, that train will stop automatically at that station. Uh, you'll hear a bunch of announcements. Uh, you'll hear sound effects. And then the train will start up and automatically go to the other station at the other end and it'll stop automatically. You'll hear announcements uh, and then it'll start up and it'll just keep doing that uh, as long as there's power on those rails. Um, uh, and then I have a train going in the other direction. Uh, so I have one, you know, if you set the speeds right and everything, then you can have them so they're, cro they're uh, passing each other. So anyway, um, you know, it runs like a charm. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with the way it came out. Uh, here's a photograph I took, what I call under the L, uh, which is what you would normally see in a New York City street. Uh, with an overhead railroad uh, running above it. And just here's another picture of Flatbush Avenue uh, with the overhead uh, L there. Uh, so hopefully I get this clinic uh, posted up on the Potomac Division website with all the other clinics. Um, uh, and I guess you all know how to get to that uh, just on a website. Uh, you can click on the clinics link and the like. And then recently, I'd, I'd written an article on this, and it was just published uh, in the, uh, uh, so on the latest issue of um, the local, uh, it was a two-part article. The first part came out in the September-October issue. Uh, and the second part uh, was just came, it just came out in the November-December issue. Uh, so you can read a little bit more about that if, if you're interested. So anyway, that's, thank you very much for your attention on this. I apologize I ran over a little bit. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm available. And, uh, you know, there's my email. If you think of anything later uh, and you want to ask it, feel free to send me an email. So with that, I'm going to figure out how to...